first off, I just want to say thank you as well for giving me the opportunity to share uh, about my culture, about my daily life uh, that I grew up with. Um, first off, I wanted to say, make sure that everyone has a pen and paper on hand, um, only because like, if you have any questions or um, as well in the end, I'm going to ask you to Google some, um, some places where you can learn more um, about uh, my culture as well, if you have any other questions. So um, I've made a small list of, um, of places that you can Google. So my name is Mel um, that's my that's my name. On my, um, my ID, my government ID, it was uh, spelled Mary Gallac. So I grew up having some teachers try and pronounce it Mary Gallac, but they couldn't, so they called me Mary. So if you're comfortable in calling me Mary, Go ahead, please. So um, I'm an Inuk. Um, back then, we were referred to as Eskimos. Um, that was the term used by the federal government. Eskimos meaning raw eaters of food, which basically, um, like, it, it fits our description because that's what we still do. Not food from the grocery stores, but food from our land. So um, the Eskimo uh, term was, was from the federal government. And today we're known as, um, I'm an Inuk. So um, Inuk is singular. In our language, it practically means person, Inuk. Um, and then if I say my family is over there, I would refer to say if there's like two or three of my brothers, I'm an Inuk, they are Inuit. So I'd say they are people. So plural, sing, singular is Inuk and plural is Inuit. So, uh, and so that's how we're identified as. So English is my second language. Our first language is called the Inuktitut language. Um, nowadays, they changed it again, thanks to the government. It's now called Inuktut, which um, they feel encompasses the whole region in Nunavut, uh, the territory that I came in from. Um, even though growing up, Inuktitut um, in our language encompasses um, every Inuk that speaks that language. So changes keep happening. Um, even our syllabic writing, because we write in syllabics for, um, in our first language, they have dropped a letter instead of I, E, O, A, and so on. It's now E, O, A. Something you would not understand until I'll actually add that on to, um, to the Google, um, to the Google terms. Um, so as I said, so Inuktitut is my first language. English is my second language. Um, so there are Inuit um, in various parts of Canada and um, where there's NWT, which is uh, Northwest Territories. The Inuit there we call uh, Inuvialuit. It's the Inuvialuit territory. And then we have the, um, uh, Inuit, we also have Inuit in Northern Quebec. Um, and their territory is called Nunavik. Uh, we also, of course, we all have our different dialects as well. Uh, we also have Inuit in Labrador, and um, we call uh, their territory is called Nunatsiavut, which is practically like the, our beautiful land. Um, and that's in Canada as well. Um, there's Inuit in Russia and Inuit in Greenland. So um, I actually have a friend who lives in Ottawa, who I worked with um, back then, and she's from Russia. She speaks her uh, Inuktitut language, which is the Yupik language, totally like over my head, um, totally different dialect, but she is, um, she is from Yupik. So those are the uh, territories, territories that, or the, uh, yeah, the territories that, that we have uh, for Inuit, as well, like, uh, even now, like we are, there's so many Inuit um, that live in Winnipeg, Edmonton, Ottawa is the main hub. 
um, Montreal is too. So we have like um, a lot of Inuit in those areas um, that like in the southern parts of Ontario, even in Sault Ste. Marie, I understand that there's three others uh, from my culture that live in Sault Ste. Marie. So I'm from Kingite, um, formerly known as Cape Dorset. That's where I was born. That's where I lived um, half of my life uh, um, growing up. Um, it used to be Cape Dorset, um, but now the government has is now changing um, every community to a name that was already the name before the Westerners came into our into our communities. So we're now um, termed Kingite, but I'll, that'll be something that I'll have you um, Google in the end, just so you can just because. Um, just because I'm from there, <laughs> I'm being vice here. But it's a beautiful place. Kingite is called um, a place of high mountains. We have like a couple of huge mountains and there's uh, one called Kingite. There's been deaths. Um, I think there's been one or two deaths now from um, not Inuit, but Westerners that had climbed it and they fell to their death. So it's a big, a huge mountain. We used to live not far, like not right under, but we were right behind that mountain growing up. And then there's another um, huge mountain, which is called Muliujak. In our language, it's Muliujak. In literal translation, it's, it's like, it looks like a nipple. It looks like a nipple and that's why it's termed um, Muliujak. So in Cape Dorset, when I was growing up, um, there's a lot of polar bears that come through Cape Dorset. So there are some mornings where we were allowed not to leave our homes because literally the polar bears would like come to the porch or even start swapping on the windows where we've had that in our home because we were so close to the King Out Mountain into in, in one of our bedrooms. So so even up to up to now they have um like polar bears that walk through um, in a lot of our communities. So Cape Dorset, where I'm from, uh, King Knight, uh, it's also known for carvers, famous carvers, as well as um, uh, as art. It's, it's very popular for their art. A lot of community members from Cape Dorset have flown all around the world um, for their art, to display their art um, in museums, um, majority of Cape Dorset art. If you go to any art gallery, you will see Cape Dorset resident art, art coming from Cape Dorset. So when I was growing up, um, there were about close to 200 people in Cape Dorset, and now there's uh, over a thousand, over a thousand people now. Um, it's grown, but it's still very small. It's a very small community compared to, um, to Ikhalut. Uh, and I'll get to Ikhalut um, after. So in Nunavut, we don't have any trees um, and food has to be flown in or shipped in. Um, and I'm not referring to Ikhalut. I'll get to Ikhalut after. This is I'm referring to the community I live in and the other communities. So, so Nunavut actually has 25 communities. So the community I came in uh, is King Knight, like I said, and some communities actually have 24 hour darkness during the winter time in Nunavut. This is just the territory, right? So, um, and during the summer, uh, the communities don't get dark. It's bright all the time like that. Like there's no darkness during the summer times. Um, I know like on my bucket list is uh, to go to a community and go spend at least like maybe about three days because hotels are very expensive, airfare is very expensive. On my bucket list is that I'd like to spend at least two or three days during the winter where there's no brightness at all. That's on my bucket list and I hope to do that someday. So, um, and as well, in um, as I said, there it's um, Nunavut is quite, it's the biggest territory um, that you'll ever find in any indigenous um, territories. Uh, Nunavut became a territory on April 1, 1999. Uh, at one time, we used to be known as Northwest Territories, as part of Northwest Territories. 
and now um, we actually have our own territory. Uh, we celebrate Nunavut Day on July 9, even though um, the territory became, became one on April 1, only because July 9 commemorated um, that, like, that we were recognized by the NWT as well as the federal government um, as, a, as a territory now, that we have like our own culture, um, our own dialect. Uh, well, I can't really say our own culture. We do have our own cultures, but slightly we have slightly differences in each community because um, we're like because we're quite big, right? So, as I said, food has to be flown in. Um, oh, sorry. Before I get there, I'm going to say um, that in Nunavut, where I grew up, because like I said, there are other Inuit communities in other areas. The Nunavut territory that I that I grew up in has actually three regions because it's so big, right? There's Kibbutz, where one of my brothers actually lived now, and they have like they're known for their herds of caribou. Um, Kitamut is uh, known for their huge fish. Um, that's another region, and then we have Hikitnala, which is where I grew up in on Baffin Island. Sounds very. Um, Sounds like wow, wow! It is. You should see the see our 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 mountains are very majestic. Even though we don't have trees, you can see for miles and miles. And there are some communities which are flat, like um, which they actually don't have any, uh, not very many mountains, but just kind of hills. Uh, so, and that's why, like, they can see polar bears for miles and miles and miles um, in some communities. Uh, so we, like I said, we celebrate our, um, we have a Nunavut day and we celebrate our day on July 9. Um, and that's when we have the big celebrations in Nunavut. So what we have also is um, food because everything has to be flown in. Um, food is three to four times more expensive, unfortunately. Uh, we don't have any malls. We don't have any highways. And um, we don't have um, very many clothing stores. You think Sault Ste. Marie has not much clothing stores? You have a lot here. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people order um, quite a bit where they travel to Ottawa. So when I talk about, um, just, just, to, just so you know, um, you know that there's a pandemic going on right now. And um, Nunavut is the only territory where there has been no cases of COVID. So uh, we've been very fortunate. And that's the 25 communities because there's no highways. And the, uh, it's so expensive to fly up there that you can't really afford to fly up there unless you have family members or you're being flown in to work up there uh, by your employer. So we've been very very fortunate um, in that sense. So um, government, um, the place where I grew up in, um, they, the main thing uh, actually in all of Nunavut is um, employment is by the government of Nunavut because we have our own government and then as well as federal government, there's jobs up there that are federal government and as well as private, um, there's private businesses as well. So um, we have hamlets as well. You know how in the cities, they have city halls. In the smaller communities, in my territory, in Nunavut, we have what are called hamlets. They're the ones that, are, that, um, that take care of the community, community's needs, uh, like the water truck, sewage truck, because a lot of our communities do not have pipes that go underground in the smaller communities. So therefore, water um, has to be delivered and sewage has to be pumped out in a lot of the smaller communities, like Cape Grosset, which is my community. There are some houses that, um, that need that. However, the health center, um, they, have, they have flushing toilets. They actually don't need a, a sewage truck to come in to pump, pump that out. So I hope I'm not talking too fast right now. No? Okay. Awesome. You're good. I've been able to follow well, Mary. Thanks. Okay, great. 
So as I said, food is way more expensive. Toilet paper is extremely expensive up there too. <laughs> uh, so everyone practically orders from Amazon. However, uh, and they were providing free shipping if you're a prime, uh, prime, um, <laughs> if you're a prime member. And then they finally figured, like they finally figured it out that it's, shipping is more important. Imp uh, sorry, is more expensive than the actual product that people were um, ordering. Then they, they um, Amazon stopped shipping to other smaller communities. Ihaluit is the prime hub. So if you live in Ihaluit, you can you have that um, you have that um, how do you say it? like you you get that you can order from Amazon to get your toilet papers, your cleaning supplies, and anything that um, you know that you you can practically get anything from from Prime from Prime sorry uh, Amazon Prime. So we have um, in the community I live in in Cape Dorset or oh, sorry where I was born um, we don't have malls we have. Uh, two stores, um, and every community has these two stores. The Khaluit is because it's so big. I'll get back to the Khaluit um, as I go down, but I'm technically talking about the community I grew up in and the other communities because the Khaluit is huge and it has more stuff than, than the other 24 communities do. So um, in the town that I grew up in, um, there are two hotels, no malls, one restaurant, but that restaurant is in a hotel, and um, there's no uh, no liquor store, there's no beer and wine store in Cape Rose at where I was born. Um, and but that, if you're a hotel guest at that one hotel, you're allowed to order or, or drink with your food or like have a glass of wine or whatever if you are a guest at that hotel in the community that I grew up in. Um, and then there is one takeout place where you can order um, fast food. Like not, we don't have McDonald's, we don't have Burger King, um, we don't have um, Wendy's. Um, like we we don't have any of those things. So, so that's why they have one little takeout place in the community I grew up in. So Co-op and Northern is the main stores in all of Nunavut except the Halloween. And I'll get to Halloween in a bit. Uh, Twenty-four communities. The co-op and the northern store are the two main stores. So the clothing that comes in are the clothing that you buy. So everyone else in the community has, this, they're wearing the same clothes that you're wearing. <laughs> so there's no fashion, fashion people <laughs> like we do like here that we take advantage of down here. <laughs> uh, so um, Inuktitut is the main language in my community. Um, we grew up in a non-English speaking home. Um, my mother is unilingual. And so that's how we grew up. And um, what else is there? So we hunt, in, we hunt for our food. Well, our hunters hunt for our food. And um, the things we eat are caribou, geese, ducks, seal, walrus, narwhal, beluga whale, Arctic char, which is a fish, cod, everybody knows what cod is. Scalpins, they're the, um, the little fish with a like, huge mouth. Um, clams, um, geoclams, mussels, berries. We have blueberries and coral bears where I'm from, as well as cranberries. Uh, we also eat polar bear, uh, but we have to cook our polar bear. Um, we eat everything raw, except the polar bear, because it's, you can die from eating um, raw polar bear. Uh, and the, you can't even eat the liver because it's so rich in, um, in iron. Like you can literally die from, die from um, the liver. But if you cook polar bear, it is delicious. I've never known anyone um, that did not cook their polar bear. And I have heard that like you need to eat that. Pork. So Otherwise, everything else that we um, that we have in some communities, they actually have muskots, which we don't have in my region. Um, places like um, um, Baker Lake have um, muskots, as well as Grease Fewer. Grease Fewer is twenty-four hour darkness as well. Um, I have a friend who is from Grease Fewer. 
I actually have Blue Dwell, which I can share. I'll show some to you uh, if we have time in my freezer, as well as grape char and some char in my freezer right now. Um, actually, I thawed some seal meat that I'm going to slow cook um, tonight because I told my a uh, couple of my friends that I would have them try seal meat, um, and they were very interested, as well as Blue Dwell. And I'll share. I'll show those when we have time in the end. So when hunters catch their food, um, like growing up, they share their food with the community. Um, and nowadays, communities have grown so big. So you can, a lot of the times nowadays, because community, in the community I grew up in, it's quite big. So um, it's usually the neighboring people from the home, that is, and they come. And we actually have, uh, when there's a seal caught, parts of that seal, we actually have um, some areas of the seal meat that is meant for men and parts of the seal meat that is meant for a woman. So uh, when they cut it up, they, and there's a bunch of like, you know, women there and the men are here and then they provide that plate that is made for uh, any woman to eat that. So because of um, the communities are getting bigger and um, there's grocery stores, a lot of our people are now selling traditional foods that I mentioned online. Um, and that's how I got my two chars, uh, was from Ikhaloui. I or actually, or I bought two chars for $20 each and then, um, and then they mail it out or I drive to Ottawa and pick it up at the cargo uh, because we only have two airlines that fly out of, um, uh, in the Nunavut Territory, and it's uh, First Air and Canadian North. So, um, yeah, and I know that with the other airlines, it's, it costs an arm and a leg, uh, arm and a leg to fly anything, anything out. So, um, hunters at times bring other locals, um, if they can, uh, from the community because of uh, colonization. There are some people, a lot of my people are losing their culture. Um, and they are, and they can't afford anything because, um, you know, because everything is so expensive up there, right? So there are some people that actually, some hunters that actually bring people um, on their hunting trips, so that they can give them the experience of of that. We even have programs now that allow hunting trips, teach hunting skills to um, Inuit who will not have, who just who cannot afford or who are at-risk people, meaning that they may have addictions or due to poverty, they can't afford to buy hunting supplies, right? So um, we're fortunate in that sense. So um, in our families growing up, men hunted. Um, they were the hunters and they were, um, they also made their own traditional um, hunting, how do you say it, like um, hunting, um, hunting stuff like hunting knives, hunting hooks, um, hunting spears, um, even hamotics. We have what's called a hamotic, uh, which you'll be able to see um, things when I give you the Google names. Um, so they they actually make hamotics, which are huge sleds that they can tow on their skidoos, and they put their hunting supplies or they carry people on that huge hamotic. Um, that they use to transport to go out hunting or even to go out on the land. So, um, so women stayed home and they cooked. Um, they kept the home in order and as well as they sewed. My mother sewed everything um, from anywhere like camics. Like in our in our community members, the women sew everything. They make camics, waterproof camics out of seal skin, caribou skin. Uh, they make um, pants like um, hunting pants, parkas, mitts, hats, you name it, they, they can sew it. Because that's like before colonization, um, that's all we had were skins from the land that we used or my ancestors used as, um, as clothing. So they still practice that uh, because it's very cold back home. Uh, it can go anywhere from like uh, minus, um, I guess like oldish is minus 30. With the wind chill, it can go up to minus 60. So where where I've grown up uh, as well, even in Ikhali. 
So, um, so sewing and doing art is very popular in our communities. That's how our tradition um, is thriving as well. Our culture is thriving in that sense. Uh, I'll show you. These were used. Usually, these are made of antler, um, and they're they're called snow goggles that our, our hunters used. Um, but this one is made out of the huge, um, huge whale. And it's made out of baleen, uh, which is part of their mouth, um, part of the, the mouth that, part of that section. But these are actually very, very good at deflecting the snow, uh, the, the glare from the snow, because if you're out in the snow, they, they also have what's called snow blindness uh, because as a, as a hunter like if they're out on all white they can get they can get snow blindness and so these the little slits are what keep the glare out from um, the snow glare out from the man's eyes and they actually use that these are um, more for show and it even came with a stand this is uh, the stand it came in and this is an uh, antler, and um, part of this little part is also an antler. So this was this is just for show, but back then they have they used antlers um, and other like or even like whalebone or things like that to make these um, glasses back then, thousands of years ago. Um, I'm actually wearing. Um, ivory studs right now, um, walrus tusk studs, and as well, these are also what our locals make. This is what they also make to make money uh, because they have no other source of income. So they make earrings out of um, ivory as well as uh, antlers, um, like bone, um, seal bone, or not really seal bone, walrus bone, caribou bone, caribou antlers, things like that. I like these. These are little, I don't know if you can see well though. These are little, like, polar bears. So those are made from antlers. Um, and then we also, they also make rings, maybe rings uh, to sell. A lot of people um, use these as wedding bands back home, um, but a lot of our communities are very modernized, tolerant. So, and these are the hunting uh, the knives. This is a woman um, cutting knife. We actually have knives that are specifically made for women and specifically made for men. Men have their own knives. This is our knives. These are awesome for cutting up vegetables, by the way. <laughs> so this is called an ulu, and it's quite sharp. It's very sharp. And I get, this was a gift from my friend because I left mine in bins um, back home. So I wish I could have showed you. I wish I could have brought my amaltic along, which I carried my son in. Um, it's a traditional clothing. And you put your child in the back. It's got a big, um, which you'll see when I ask you to Google. Oh, I've got some Google links that you can actually look look at. So we have those, and um, and I, as I said, you know, sorry, my girlfriend is the um, she makes art, and she makes. I'm pretty proud of it. This was made for my daughter. Like that. I'll surprise her when I um, when I take it. Right, so I'm keeping it for now. <laughs> it goes well in the kitchen. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, so those are some things. Nowadays, talking about our traditions as well. Uh, back then, um, tattoos were things that were used as well, and they were used up here in as um, like a I guess like a V shape up on. The, the forehead as well as on the face and on the uh, under the chin about well, on the chin or even little lines on the chin and it's coming back a lot of our youth are actually using that now it's come back as well as on the fingers 
and they're even using it on the on the chest these days on their wrist so it's the tattoo is really coming back our traditional tattoos are really coming back which were um, which we were losing which were which were not allowed when because of colonization which I'll get into um, after so uh, so these are just some things that are actually coming back and talking about art the uh, one of this is a coaster um, Tattoo, tattoos, these are the kinds of tattoos that are also used. And this is our traditional, this is a coaster. And those, this, these are also tattoos. Um, so yeah, I've got, uh, I've got those. Here's another one. These were gifts from one of my coworkers uh, when I was leaving. So yeah, so those are coasters that I use. Okay, and um, what else is there now? So when um, everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of our uh, sewing is something that a lot of my people take pride in, a lot of the women, so much so that Canada Goose reached out to the communities when they saw how well Inuit women make parkas. So Canada Goose reached out to Nunavut, to Inuit communities to see uh, they had... Um, like they provided the material and they provided the sewing supplies so that they can have a showcase of Inuit parkas not long ago. And one of the young ladies um, was selected to be uh, part of that show that Canada Goose had. So you can even Google Canada Goose and Inuit, Inuit clothing or Inuit parka Canada Goose as well. So those, those are very strong in our, in our communities as well. So, um, I live in, oh, any questions at this time at all? No? Okay, that's fine. So right now, uh, before I came to Sault Ste. Marie, I live in Iqaluit. I had mentioned Iqaluit um, quite a bit. Oh, well, actually, before I go in there, I just wanted to say a little bit more, like our families are quite strong. Oh, shoot, I almost forgot to mention too, we also have customs. We have adoption customs that the government recognized, um, and so it was implemented into our, um, into our government um, because the federal government didn't do that. Custom adoption, um, like my, I have a son who was adopted out to my mom's late common law, and, um, but he grew up knowing, knowing me as a mother. He grew up knowing my mother um, as a grandmother. He knows who his sister is. He knows who his uncles and sisters, uh, uncles and aunts are from my family. And that's how our adoptions are in our culture. Um, I, I thought I'd mention that too, because I know there's lots of restrictions in the, um, in the Western culture when it comes to adoption. So our adoption policy is called, uh, or the Adoption Act is um, custom adoption. So that's, we feel that like, you know, it's, it should be transparent and they should know um, who their real parents are. Also, when someone passes away in our um, communities, my mother didn't choose my name. Well, she did, but um, in our culture, when someone dies in our community, out of respect, my mother was pregnant with me um, when um, one of our relatives um, daughter passed away so when she, my mother gave birth to me she named me my name um, so I'm named after every person in our community is named after someone who had passed already so that's what I'm trying to say um, that's part of our culture so when my dad passed away there are so many there's at least about in our family anyway there's a uh, Three Uktuhi Ashunas, because our last name is Ashuna, right? Three Uktuhi Ashunas. And can you imagine? It's a good thing, like, we're not polluted in, in, um, in how do you say, like, um, um, like crimes where you can take someone else's identity. <laughs> because, like, you've already got three Ashunas, three Uktuhi Ashunas in Dorset, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so it, it's pretty... Um, Pretty neat on how on how that works. Um, there's other one Melagala, a young lady in Cape Dorset right now. So there's two of us. The other Melagala passed away. 
So I thought I'd better mention that as well because I had um, had forgotten to write it down. So I currently live in Haluit, Nunavut, which is um, um, the capital of Nunavut. It's the hub. We actually have doctors. We have a hospital. All the other communities have health centers and only nurses in the 24 communities. The 25th community, the city, which is now the city of Ikharu, because there's 8,000 people there now. Growing up, there used to be 500 to 600 to 700 people. Now it's like 8,000, up to 8,000 people now. We actually have a beer in mind store that just opened last year, and um, I'm very cognizant of the time because um, we're almost there already. So the Halloween is the main hub now, um, and we have a very thriving community right now. There's lots of jobs available available up there. Um, even even if you see that um, that it says Inuit beneficiaries will be given consideration, do know that not a lot of our people are qualified for our, for the jobs that are put out in the government of Nunavut. So that's something to keep in mind. So I didn't get into um, colonization, but I did give a little hint, like I did give you a little bit of, um, you know, um, on how, um, on how due to colonization, we were not allowed to speak our language, we were not allowed to practice our culture. Um, so therefore, there's some communities that do not speak the Inuit language uh, because of that, because of residential schools. So, so just so you know, but those are the ones, those are the main things that I thought that were important. We also have a tunic time, a spring festival which is um, Nunavut wide and Haluit is the main hub that actually has that. And they have igloo building contests, um, seal skinning contests, bannock making. They even have what's called Fear Factor right now, which is very modern, modernized as well. So they put in some uh, modern kick into our, uh, into that. So because the federal government um, didn't know how to pronounce my name or a lot of our families, they give me a number back then. My number, actually is E72155. That's what was on my brown disc that was referred to as a dog tag. So every time I went to, the, my mother took me to the health station, they didn't say my name, they gave me, she would go into that health station and give them my number, my disc, as opposed to my name because they didn't know how to pronounce my name. So that's why a lot of us have um, an E or an E number they refer to it. So that's one of the things as well. Um, but that said, we don't have very much time. I really appreciate, um, I'm sorry I didn't get into colonization, um, but um, I had so much fun talking about my culture. It's like, hey. <laughs> uh -huh.